Hello everyone and welcome to my channel. My name is Crown and today we are going to have some more stories that I hope that you will enjoy. But before we start, it would be so much appreciated if you would subscribe to the channel, like the video if you enjoyed it and maybe leave a comment down below. These simple clicks would mean a lot to the future of this channel and really reward the effort that I put in every day. And now, without further ado, let's go. First story. Hearing aids does not equal earbuds. This happened a few years ago, around the time I was 17. I had just started working at a smallish cafe run by a well-known family in our area. I knew some people who had worked there before, and they told me for the most part the owners were great, very chill and laid back when it was slow, and normally weren't bad about breezing down the employees' necks. Their oldest daughter, who also helped run everything, was the one who was very peculiar. We will call her Karen. I'm officially diagnosed with a hearing deficiency. Not enough to be considered deaf, but more than hard of hearing. So I wear hearing aids. My first day before we opened, my co-workers asked me if they could do anything else to help me out. And we eventually started talking about the hearing aids in general. While talking about everything I mentioned, they had Bluetooth capabilities, so I could play music through them. Not that I would, but I could. Karen had been in the room at the time and said, You can't wear those, no earbud policy, and tapped on the policy's paper on the wall. I protested, explaining that they are hearing aids and not earbuds, and that I wouldn't be using them to listen to any music while I was working. Her reasoning was I didn't need them because I wasn't considered fully deaf, and I was doing this to get around that no earbud policy, directly quoting when I said they could play music. I can't wear them? Okay, let's see how this goes. Placed them into the case in my bag and started my shift. I couldn't understand my trainer, couldn't hear the customers, couldn't hear when orders were called to be sent out. Things were going extremely slow. A couple of warm pastries burnt since I wasn't able to hear the timers. Simple sentences had to be repeated multiple times, with people basically yelling at me just for me to be able to piece a few words together. I guess that cherry on top was me, ignoring one of the owners when she tried speaking to me. Karen came up to me and tried addressing me about it, until she finally realized what was going on after she had repeated herself five times. By the end of that shift, I was allowed to wear my hearing aids again, no questions asked. Next story. Scumbag aunt ripped off my grandma for years, I put my nose in her business and had the IRS financially ruin her. This happened about five years ago. My grandma was getting old, late 80s, early 90s, and she had one wish to not die in a senior home. Easily done as my grandpa sold some assets way back when they invested the money and let it ride for 30 plus years. He never touched it and collected the pension. Way back when my grandpa died about 10 years before this, my grandma appointed my dad, this jerk aunt, and my uncle as the trustees of the trust. Basically, the trusted advisors for her and her care for the foreseeable future. All was well in the beginning, then my dad Willie moved further away and couldn't take care of the day-to-day -day upkeep as a trustee and to see that my grandma was okay. My aunt Rebecca told her that she and my uncle Fred, who lived in Arizona, could take over and all would be fine. And it was fine for a while. A few times my dad went back to visit and noticed my grandma didn't always have overnight care or that her mail wasn't picked up and that the driveway wasn't plowed. She also lost her cable TV and newspaper subscription. My dad figured it just lapsed, so he had the services put back on. My dad also noticed my grandma was eating moldy food at times because her truck was sold and she had no transportation. She drove up to 90 years old. She basically just chilled at the house alone and did crossword puzzles. 
The craziest part of this is that my aunt only lived two miles from grandma. While my grandma told my dad she saw Aunt Rebecca once a week on Saturday for about one hour. As was the elderly in age, my grandma passed away. She did get her wish and was able to die in her own home. Upon her death, things started to get real interesting. Once the probate lawyer got her children, my dad, aunt, uncle, and another estranged aunt, Becky, around the table, some shady business started to come out. My aunt Rebecca asked that everyone just forgo any audit or paperwork and they just sell the house for around $400,000 and divide up the remaining bank account balance of roughly $400,000. So just signing on the line, each sibling was to get a check for $200,000. Not too bad of an inheritance. However, my dad thought that was somewhat a little rushed. He said at the time that he wanted to wait because my grandma's house was easily in the $600,000 range based on size and location. And my aunt exploded in his face, cursing at him and calling him all kinds of names because he was unwilling to sign the assets then and there. She basically wanted a quick close while everybody looked the other way. My dad ended up leaving the room after the screaming and the deal wasn't signed that day. It took nearly six months before another appointment and they were all back at the table. The thing is though, when you are a trustee and the person dies, the funds and access to financial accounts are all under heavy scrutiny until all the beneficiaries are made aware and sign the final papers. At the next meeting, my dad went in there with no intention to sign the deal. He got his brother, my uncle Fred, to agree that they audited the entire accounts going back five years. When they demanded this again at the meeting with the lawyer, my aunt ended up arguing that a forensic audit would cost $5,000 and it's just a waste. Like what difference does it make? Two beneficiaries requested it, so it was what was going to happen. The audit report showed up about three months later. And here is where it gets good. My dad began looking over the audit report and saw it was full of holes. Like excessive monthly food costs for a 90-year-old lady. Payments made for car services for a car my grandma no longer had. Many different things in there that just did not add up. My dad asked me to give the audit a second look. So I spent a Saturday night going over it. And here is some crazy stuff I found and alerted my dad about. Costco monthly food cost of around $2,000 for the last four years. Telephone bills for six cell phones. Grandma has a home phone only. Gasoline for a truck my grandma did not have for like four years. And easily $400 a month. House repairs paid to my aunt's husband who owned a construction business some of the house repairs were like $16,000 for a new roof, new garage doors, home security system which she didn't have, etc. and all inflated prices. Grandma paid for my aunt to go to Europe twice on vacation. My grandma was paying my estranged aunt Picky a stipend of 2k a month for the last 5 years, as well as her deadbeat son for $2,500 every month they were paid. All grandkids were to be paid a lump sum of 10k upon their 30th birthday as that is when the $50 check from grandma stopped for all the grandkids. Guess who was paid out? Her kids and my estranged aunt kids. But not me or my siblings. My grandma gave loans to my aunt Rebecca for her husband construction business in return for equity in the company which amounted to nothing. These loans totaled about $200,000 over three years, right around when the housing bust happened. And they also sold her assets like jewelry and whatnot for cash, because some big ticket items simply vanished from her house. Armed with all of this, the next probate meeting was interesting. In the meantime, in the time between my grandma's death and the third probate meeting, my aunt's construction business filed for bankruptcy. 
So that $200,000 in equity grandma had simply vanished. The probate lawyer was also somewhat concerned and made it obvious that this was fraud and breach of fiduciary duty, or my aunt could actually get real prison time. After this, the negotiations were much more favorable. My aunt got nothing, literally zero. My other aunt only received 25k after all the stipend payments, and my father and uncle shared the rest. After all, grandkids received a 10k payout. The house sold at the first offer for $520,000. That was a regular revenge for any treacherous witch that ripped off grandma and had her eating moldy food. And here is a pro. My aunt probably felt pretty bad that she couldn't supplement her lifestyle with grandma's money anymore. But that was the least of her worries. Since she tried to personally rip me off for 10k, I took it personally. I don't care how tough you are. The IRS is the scariest thing that can happen to a person. Nobody wants to have their money forcibly removed. I did the little research and found the 3949A. I also had the audit and legal office could slash would provide the full trust requested, demanded by the IRS. I don't know if it ever was. So I photocopied my documents, had them notarized, and sent off the information to the IRS. I felt like it went nowhere. Then maybe 18 months later I was notified and asked to come to the IRS building for an appointment in my city. The agent went over all the details, what they found in the research, and then they asked for a sworn statement. It turns out my aunt did not declare something like 1-2.000 in additional income over 5 years. And as such, she owed the IRS around 420 k plus penalties. There was no way she was going to pay that on a teacher's pension. And after her husband bankruptcy his business. Her house was sold, her vehicle sold, and they left the state. Now my aunt and uncle live in a depressing desert town like this in the southwest. The IRS paid me around $60,000 about three months after the appointment. She should have paid me that $10,000. Next story. Don't want to pay my asking price? Okay. Years ago, I sold my first motorcycle. It was a good bike, but as it was my first motorcycle, I had laid it down a couple of times doing stupid stuff. So it wasn't perfect. I took good care of it though. It always replaced damaged or scratched things because I didn't want it to look bad. Well, except for the left side of the engine, aka the stator cover. The sides of most motorcycle engines will often make contact with the ground and get scratched up if the bike slides on its side, which mine did on several occasions. I had replaced a stator cover before and didn't want to go through that again, even though it's about a $120 part. Plus, the scrapes on the stator cover weren't that bad and I could live with them. So, I list my bike for sale, show it to a few people, and along comes a dad with his young adult son. Now the dad, being an older and wiser rider, riding for as many years as the moon has orbited planet Earth, knew he had the better end of the bargain. He was there looking at my first bike that had been gently crashed before, which I was fully upfront about. Easy bargain, right? I was pretty firm on my asking price, for one simple reason. I was going to throw in all the brand new parts, accessories and maintenance items I had accumulated for this bike. A couple of oil filters, case of oil, brake pads and new stator cover, and even an inoperable engine, which still had many many good parts on it. But if and only if they had paid my asking price. This was easily $300 in parts, excluding the engine. The dad of the buyer played the back cup in the scenario, pointing out things that he thought could give him some bargaining power, and then of course made a lower offer. I entertained the offer, but at the same time informed him of my conditions for getting the spare parts. We do not need the spare parts. 
Ok, I counter offered, explaining that my asking price was already very competitive given the condition of my bike. We settled on $100 less than my asking price, so they left with only the bike and none of the parts. A few days go by and the buyer reaches back out to me to ask if they can come by to pick up the stator cover for free to replace the scratched one that was on the bike. I replied with sorry, I'm going to sell it to make up for the discount I gave you on the motorcycle. A replacement stator cover costs more than $100 they solved in the purchase, but if they paid me that $100, they would have gotten the cover, along with supplies for their first oil change, $80, Brake pads, $75, sprockets, $90, plus a whole another engine to tinker around with. The engine had catastrophically failed, so it wasn't worth much, but the parts on it are still so expensive to buy. Next story. Another snotty entitled racist douche. I'm a Midwestern white guy of Scottish descent. If I get too much sun, I'll explode in plate flames. I am so white. My wife and kids are not. My wife and kids are Mexican. And my presence makes family barbecues interesting. And I have been known to harness the power of my whiteness when police are called because a birthday party for an 8-year-old niece slash nephew gets out of hand. Now that we have that out of the way, one of my Mexican sons married a Guatemalan woman. Needless to say, they speak a lot of Spanish. Occasionally, I find myself out with my daughter-in-law, and as a South American woman, she absolutely cannot function without a high enough coffee-to-blood ratio. So we are sitting in a certain mermaid-themed coffee shop in a mall, having a conversation in Espanol. Have you ever wondered how you know if the person that says this is America and we speak English here is a racist prick or just a lazy self-entitled prick? It is moments like this. When the racist prick sees two people having a private conversation in Spanish and walks by the white guy to harass a pregnant Latin woman. Now anybody who has ever met a Latina knows that. You piss them off at your own risk. This is a good way to find out if a high-heeled shoe can be absorbed rectally. I will neither confirm nor deny that. I already know the answer to this question. When you piss off a Latina, you will get no help from others. They know better. They also do not want to get any of you on them when they start ripping your vital organs out of your own mouth. So this racist sea hag hitches up her Louboutin Clutches her Michael Kors bag, struts past me, bends right down in my daughter-in-law face, and screams at the top of her lungs, Speak English or go back where you came from! You people are destroying this country! My daughter-in-law stands up and, without a word, slaps the Gucci sunglasses right off her face. And she sits back down. See, Hank's head spins around, she takes the time to look around and lays down on the ground, screaming at the top of her lungs that this foreign immigrant terrorist has had assaulted her for no reason. Call the police. Call the army. See, Hag's husband comes running over and is just about to get in my daughter-in-law's face when I stand up. Let us just say that I absolutely dwarf this guy. I stand over six feet tall, have a beard down to my chest, and I pick heavy things up and put them down again in my spare time. As a result, I tip the scales north of 300 pounds, and each of my thighs is larger than my daughter-in-law's waist. He's maybe 5 foot 6, and with 6 dollars in change in each pocket, might weigh 125 pounds. I take one look at this guy, he goes whiter than he already was, and I say, think very hard. Any part of you that touches her, I'm going to break off and force feed it to you. Now go away and take that thing with you. As I point to the sea hag, they slink off to sit in a booth on the other side of the coffee shop. Naturally, someone has called the police who show up in short order. The sea hag immediately launches into her speech about how she was just minding her own business and 
Out of nowhere, this crazed terrorist attacked her, and that red-bearded race traitor beat the hell out of her husband and laughed at him. She thinks his nose might be broken. They both need to be in jail. Now, the second cop comes over to our table, and my daughter-in-law turns on the waterworks. The crazy woman started screaming at me. I was just defending myself. She places a hand on her stomach and says, In my baby, and also defending my baby. I summon my powers of whiteness and tell the officer, I'm certain this place has cameras. There are at least a dozen witnesses to that woman's screaming tirade. And I assure you that my daughter-in-law will not be answering any more of your questions without her attorney present. The cops take a few minutes to talk to a couple of other people, look at the security footage, and come back to tell us that, while the daughter-in-law probably shouldn't have slapped the sea hag, it is pretty clear that it was in self-defense. And while they will be filing out a report, they won't be arresting anyone. And now we have reached the end of today's stories. Thank you for watching and see you next time.